you're in the water loop. <laughs> Hey, this is Travis with Waterloop. You've probably heard me talk about how much I like High Sierra showerheads for their incredible water efficiency, their solid metal construction, and because it's a small business based in the U.S. with owner David Malcolm having a commitment to water and energy conservation. While I hope you value my opinion, there are some pretty major endorsements you should listen to. High Sierra showerheads were rated best showerhead by Popular Science and CNET, and best low flow showerhead by Wirecutter. If you go on Amazon, you'll see that High Sierra gets the highest ratings, four and a half to five stars, from all the satisfied customers. You can use promo code Waterloop for 20% off at HighSierraShowerheads.com. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Very pleased for this episode to be joined by Dr. Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech. Mark, thank you for coming on the podcast. So nice to be here, Travis. Yeah. So a lot of people might be familiar with you because of the Flint drinking water crisis and what had unfolded there with lead. Um, could you kind of briefly talk about your work in Flint? I know there's a lot there uh, and you've been involved, were involved for a long time, but if you could kind of give a summary of, of how you got involved and, and what your work was. The road to Flint actually started by innovating a new research area in the drinking water field, specifically looking at the problems that occur with bacteria, lead, and leaks that occur in consumers' homes. And historically, all research ended at the property line. But what I realized back in about 1990 when I was starting out as a first a engineer and then postdoc and research professor was that the problems of the 21st century were occurring where we were using the water in people's homes. And this was a paradigm shift because up until that point, we had solved all our problems in waterborne disease by removing contaminants at the treatment plant. But lead is something, is a contaminant that occurs from home plumbing. Of course, leaks and private infrastructure plumbing in homes is very, very expensive. And Legionella is actually representative of a type of bacteria that grows in consumers' homes or buildings and you are exposed to it in the shower. So I started down this path and, you know, a lot of people thought I was crazy because why are you taking samples? And I said, well, that's where the problems are uh, in homes. And I guess it was destined to create problems because this, no one wants responsibility for these issues. The, the water industry uh, likes to end its responsibility at the property line. And although there was a law, the lead and copper rule that extended their responsibility, shared responsibility all the way to the tap, uh, they didn't really like it. They never really accepted that law. So in any case, it, it put me in it, 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 what is a key public health battlefield of the 21st century. By its nature, for some reason, was considered controversial because that's where people were dying and being exposed to lead and a lot of folks didn't want to know about that and so you know i had to in some ways um, betray many institutions who were funding me to expose these problems and that first started that journey first started in washington dc when i was working with the epa and they had a water crisis which is known in the press as the Washington, D.C.-led crisis. And in the history of scientific disasters, this is unique because the D.C.-led crisis was completely caused by government agency, scientists and engineers. Uh, no profit motive whatsoever. These are the environmental policemen paid to protect us who – uh, it's the EPA, it's the Army Corps of Engineers that treats the water, it's the local government that distributes the water. And that was just a horrible awakening for me because I'd never thought, never conceived of government agencies becoming environmental criminals. But 
It happened in D.C. There were thousands of children, lead poisoned. Uh, it was covered up. Uh, there were miscarriages. There were fetal deaths. It took seven years. It was just horrible of being a whistleblower before there was a bipartisan hearing in 2010 that, that completely vindicated and showed that all these people were harmed. And it was a horrific cover up that extended even to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. So that was the road to Flint. And when this problem was exposed in 2010, you know, we can either learn from our mistakes or we're destined to repeat them. And the agencies involved never accepted responsibility. No one was punished except the whistleblowers who laid down their professional lives to expose these problems. The good people were fired and the criminals were kept on and even rewarded. And so I knew another another D.C. was inevitable. And that's what happened in Flint. And when it happened, we were ready for it. So people in Flint started realizing there's an issue with lead and they reach out to you to come in and take a look at, at the science of what was going on. Well, that's one. The true story is that for 18 months, federal law was being broken in Flint. The lead and copper was being broken. Again, it was all misconduct by government scientists and engineers and, and it unfortunately involved the EPA Region 3 and the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, as well as local officials from the utility. But, you know, there were heroic people. It's a travesty that I even had to be involved. I was working with homeowners in Flint and a brave EPA whistleblower named Miguel Del Toro, who happens to be at Region 5, and he's the foremost expert in the lead and copper oil regulation in the United States. And so at first he put his career on the line and wrote a memo that said EPA was abdicating its responsibility. Federal law was not being enforced in Flint. And of course he was retaliated against and told to never talk to anyone from Flint or about Flint again. So when that effort failed, even after it got in the press, incredibly enough, we kind of launched a science war in collaboration with Flint residents against the environmental policemen, who in this case were environmental criminals. They were breaking federal law. They knew it. They were covering it up. And what's worse, it was shocking how hard they worked to cover it up when all they had to do was put orthophosphate in the water for a cost of $100 a day. But following the law it was, um, for some bizarre reason, this is just not an option to these people. I and mean, I'll never understand it. Mm -hmm. So we exposed that. We did the investigative science. And, you know, you have to become a a reporter because, frankly, investigative reporters don't exist anymore. So we did the Freedom of Information Act request. We started a blog page to expose this misconduct. And after we did their work for them, reporters would pick the story up sometimes. And at no point, you know, were we ever proven wrong, but we did in some cases cross the line when given there was a law, it, we felt a law was being broken. We, we did advocate and stood with Flint residents on the lawn in front of City Hall one day and it, presented our scientific data. And it was very clear there was a citywide lead problem. And then within a few weeks after that and recognition that the blood lead of Flint children was also rising you know, the whole house of cards came down and, hmm. you know, we, America just looked horrible because if you're judged by how you treat your most vulnerable in Flint is our poor city uh, and these laws were flaunted and broken and covered up, um, it, you know, it was a fundamental betrayal of the public trust by scientists and engineers. And unfortunately, no one can get wrapped their heads around that. So they like to blame politicians <laughs> wrongly in my opinion, but that's another story. <laughs> so, you know, you, you went through the, the lead situation in Washington, DC. Um, but so you, so you've been through some of this before, but how did Flint being so involved with that for so long impact your perspectives and, and your approaches to, to this field? It, it, ha it had to, it had to have some impact, right? Yeah, no, I mean, D.C. was definitely the crucible. It was horrific, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. What you know, my, 
my family went through because we were virtually alone in confronting the corrupt power of five different government agencies. And it's rare you come out of that in a hole. And I'm not to say that I did, but we were ultimately vindicated in the congressional hearing and through the science. And in Flint, initially, it was something of a triumph because we prepared to fight this war when and not if another DC occurred, and that was Flint. And we we didn't want to fight it, but after Miguel, the whistleblower at EPA, was taken out, you know, there was no other option. And so you don't you don't fight a war to win. You fight you, you don't fight a war to wound someone. You fight to win. And you know, it was. I mean, a lot of people would say we went too far in our tactics, you know, the web page, the investigative reports, the Freedom of Information Act requests, the humiliation of government science agencies. And uh, but, you know, if it's that versus standing by and letting little kids be poisoned or ultimately people dying from Legionnaire's disease, there were 12 deaths from Legionella in Flint that were related that we uncovered. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I will go there um, if there's no other option. So we did, and I'm not going to apologize for it. But we were, you know, I understand the criticism of our tactics, and we uh, we received far more than our fair share of awards and far more than our fair share of criticism. So. But after, you know, after that kind of triumphant phase when it became an international and national news sensation, opportunists were drawn to Flint like moth to a bright light. Uh, oh my gosh, academic professors who lied about their credentials to get millions of dollars and do work that they were completely unqualified for. Uh, grandstanding in the press, alleging felon felonies against public officials who we felt were doing their job and ultimately uh, leading to trials, the most expensive pre-trials, longest pre-trials in Michigan history that spent $30 million before they were abandoned, you know. Um, you had Hollywood actors like Mark Ruffalo bringing his nonprofit to town and scaring people for no reason, um, spreading scientific misinformation. And, you know, you see this vacuum of trust that's created and the horror of what will fill that vacuum if the agencies aren't able to fulfill their role. And so even after they were trying to do their job, there was no getting that trust back. And so, you know, this is kind of, I think, think Flint it resembles what a new dark age would look like. It's when you can't trust anybody, what happens? Uh, people turn to alternative sources of information and it becomes anarchy. It becomes literally to this day. Uh, this is not an exaggeration. Flint residents, and you can understand why, many of them are so afraid they still are bathing in bottled water and even using bottled water to flush their toilets. Wow. That's how uh, scared they are of their water. And that's some almost four years after uh, the lead levels have returned to normal levels. Safe, yeah. Gosh, it sounds like an incredible number of massive distractions from really the health of children and and pregnant mothers which was really the priority with lead it's like that's what sh people should put their energy and attention and resources on and all this other nonsense proliferated around it um yeah it's when science and scientists become political and they become advocates for one tribe or the other. Their loyalty to the EPA is put above their loyalty to the public. Um, so to with MDEQ, it's, it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. I, I want to understand a little better about your approach, your work at Virginia Tech. So you have part of part of your program there is having is this type of work, this type of investigative science, uh, advocacy, activism, and you kind of show this is a way to, to tackle these issues. I, I'm really curious about kind of that, how you have things set up through the university there and, and how you do this work. Well, this, you know, there's no pot of money to save the world, unfortunately. And if you want to do that, you have to do it on your own dime and your own time. So all of this work, frankly, is a hobby. Now, it's a hobby that's taking up 40 hours a week. But, 
you know, I still have to do my normal job. And so too, when somehow, some way I have to pay for this without using state or university or research sponsor fundings. Although in recent years, we've gotten donations from people and sponsors who have um, helped us do this type of work. But all of Flint was funded out of my own pocket through, with the exception of one small grant we got from the National Science Foundation. So, you know, that's really the setup is that, you know, you, you're passionate about science and protecting the public welfare and seeking and speaking the truth. And you see this, uh, perhaps this hobby is more important than my normal job mm. <laughs> in terms of the impact it's had. There's, there's no doubt about it in terms of protecting public health. So sometimes you have to go off the beaten path, unfortunately. And that's, you know, that's what we've done. And the university has tolerated it. They have not fired me yet, uh, thankfully. And that's a huge compliment, um, to, by the way. I can't ask for, you can't ask for anything more than that. And they've even, to some extent, uh, been supportive, especially in recent years. And, you know, I don't really feel it's, it's activism or ac- advocacy. Um, I think that's a very dangerous role for a scientist. You know, we we seek and speak the truth, and we're going to make you mad at us sooner or later, because someday the data is not going to be to your liking. And I'm sorry, that's how science works. So uh, we we seek the data, we present the data. Sometimes uh, we work with communities and we show that their water is really just crappy and expensive. And unfortunately, there's nothing illegal with that. And people are disappointed because people, in many cases, want to believe they're living the next Flint. And so, you know, most of our work with communities shows them that, you know, unfortunately, uh, they're, they're not the next Flint. I personally think that's a fortunate thing, but when you when you want attention and you want money to help you because your city's in desperate financial straits, um, you know you, you want the attention, you want the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that Flint has received in relief. Uh, and so that's you know another issue is that it, we don't have a way to get these poor communities money short of a disaster like Flint occurring. But it's shocking that we have exposed so many cases of illegal activity. So yeah, we've done that. Um, I call that investigative science. Uh, it does get into activism at some point because if, if science fails and you're dealing with unreasonable people, you have to cross the line and, you know, publicize what you're doing and expose their, their misconduct. And you have to use tactics that, get attention in the press. Mm. Uh, but I don't like doing that. I hate doing that. Uh, but it's necessary. And I will go there if it means exposing law breaking. Sure. Investigative science. I like that, that term. <laughs> um, what, what do you usually, what do you do at Virginia Tech then? What do you teach? Well, I teach a, a graduate course on, um, engineering ethics that I developed with someone I met in the Washington DC battle. And it's a unique class where we kind of go into just how difficult it is to be ethical in today's world as a scientist or engineer and all the pressures that could put you off course of your life's goal of serving the public good, serving the public welfare and all those people who committed crimes. You know, I don't think any of them either woke up in the morning or set out in their career uh, to poison people or cause legionnaires disease deaths or break the law. But, you know, that's kind of the default condition if you're not careful. So we go through a lot of case studies and talk about these pressures. And we also talk about how difficult it is to be a truth speaker in today's post-truth world, because people are going to hate on you. They're going to attack you. And there's a reason uh, the, these injustices go unaddressed. And frankly, it's because it's occurring in a blind spot of society and, and folks don't want you to shine a light on it. And so, you know, we go through all of that and the trials and tribulations of being a whistleblower and why humans so so hate whistleblowers who put loyalty to humankind, who put loyalty to the truth above 
their loyalty to their institutions or friends. Mm. Um, it's human nature, unfortunately, and um, it's a characteristic, I think, of a post-truth society, which we are living in. Yeah. Um, I want to hear a little bit of, more about the other communities that you all have done investigative science in. When we talked beforehand, you rattled a few of them off to me. So I was wondering if you could kind of tick those off now and what, what the problems are in those places. Well, three recent examples were quite fascinating and have been in the news. So one was St. Joseph, Louisiana, where we collaborated with an amazing professor from LSU, Dr. Adrian Kantner, and she was working with this community. We helped her take a few lead samples. And so it was around the time of Flint and when they discovered this high lead in a predominantly poor African-American community, the state was very proactive and declared a uh, state emergency and brought in about $10 million of relief, which is just astonishing given the size of St. Joseph. But they had really crappy discolored water. They also had lead and the state came in and sort of fixed the infrastructure after this was exposed. And on that journey, we also found out about science, uh, about misconduct, government misconduct, where the mayor was had been taking money from the town for many, many years. Uh, and that was very unfortunate as well. But is that, a state, ca is that a case where the state response, uh, it's like, hey, this is what should happen when a problem is discovered. This is the good, the good role that government should serve. Well, they, they very clearly did because they didn't want the adverse publicity of the town that became the next Flint. Mm. But they also said when they did it explicitly um, in writing that no other community in Louisiana can expect this. This was a one-time thing. <laughs> Uh, so it's fascinating. They, they go, we just can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So only St. Joe you know, will benefit from that. And another example is the, what we found in Denmark, South Carolina, where an amazing citizen science African-American couple there had over a period of decades had symptoms from their water, um, itching and health ailments, and they felt the water's making them sick, and they collected samples and cataloged them and wrote their Congress people and had a lawyer, and there was a consent order. All kinds of problems were discovered. A consent order was signed with the state. But we eventually came in because, the, you know, they were everyone was done with this community. They weren't going to help them, and we sampled and sampled, and we couldn't find anything wrong with the water, and but the mayor just wouldn't let us uh, sample the wells the, at the wellhead. We had one thing left, which was we wanted to sample the wells. Five times I started there with permission to sample the wells. Five times I was told I couldn't do it. Uh, they changed their mind. And so we later discovered that uh, the community had been for a decade been dosing a pesticide illegally to their water that – coincidentally enough caused the exact symptoms that these folks were complaining about and uh you know this was covered up and there's now a big class action lawsuit and so there's a cnn documentary on it called dirty water uh that, that shows the initial phases of that and it's covered in the newspapers after that but you know that was another example of a community doing this to themselves and realizing, you know, I don't like to point fingers. And if you put people in impossible situations, they'll do bad things. I mean, that was the case with Flint. Hmm. That was the case with St. Joe in Denmark, wherein these communities literally do not have money to maintain their existing system or to meet federal law. And so they're faced with a, a, a heartbreaking decision in many cases, which is cutting corners uh, the cheapest legal alternative was not implemented there uh, to fix the problem that they had. And so they resorted this, to this illegal pesticide and, you know, not a good situation. But I think we all have to take responsibility for what's happened because, again, Flint, Denmark, St. Joe, they're, they're kind of ahead of the curve in terms of going bankrupt. Many many of our cities and towns are, are going bankrupt as we speak. And that trend has been accelerated due to COVID. And 
So what are we going to do without the infrastructure funding that, that allows them to upgrade or maintain their systems? Well, I wanted to ask you um, what you think the primary problems are with with drinking water in the U.S. You know um, that that leads to these situations. I think you've you've pointed to money as being one of the big ones, um, and government accountability or transparency. What, how would you kind of describe that the problem with America's drinking water that in these situations? Well, unfortunately, again, um, I have to call out my own tribe and my own institution, which is science and engineering, first and foremost, none of these failures would occur without scientific misconduct and unethical behavior. And it's especially disconcerting with the environmental policemen. And so it's a, it's a problem in many ways analogous to what we're seeing with community policing right now, wherein what do you do if you can't trust the police person? Mm. Uh, and we didn't have an answer to that, and we're, we're evolving one as a society now. But there's no plan B um, for a check and balance on the power of corrupt government agencies or unethical scientists or engineers, unfortunately. So obviously, I'm not very popular for saying that, but um, I, I believe it to be true. And if you don't like it, that's your tough luck, because the, the evidence shows that time and time again, that is a big part of the problem. So... The, the root cause, though, is prioritization, and we're not making money available for infrastructure. And in these towns, these financially strapped towns and cities, water is always the first thing they can cut corners on because you stop investing and in upgrading your pipes or your water treatment processes. And if you just take the samples in the wrong way, oftentimes you can pretend the water is meeting federal law when it really isn't. And so that's where, you know, we've made our, our, our biggest mark is when we've shown that people were being lied to time and time again. They're being told their water is um, meeting federal law when it's not. So, you know, actually, I'm an agnostic on this issue. I mean, if, if as a country we want to say, um, gee, it's every person for themselves, um, we'll get you water. Uh, in quantity at your house, but if you want it to not harm you or your family, you're going to have to invest in your own treatment. Um, if that's how we want to roll, you know, so be it. But don't pretend that these these people uh, in Amer parts of America that are left behind are getting the same safe water uh, that is mandated under federal law. Yeah. So our basic premise of all our work is that it's wrong to tell people their water's safe when it's not. And um, that is where we've gotten into all these problems and exposed all these water crises. Yeah. What would be the, the couple things you would do to repair drinking water in America, it, you know, if someone put you in charge of that? Well, where we're heading is it is every person for themselves. The, our rule is you get the water you can afford. And this is very cost ineffective too many of our most vulnerable poor people in this country are spending their precious financial resources believe it or not on bottled water or in-home treatment systems and these are very cost ineffective uh, you can't blame them for doing it because they've witnessed things like denmark and flint and how do they know that they're not next and we've gone beyond that oh, there's just, these are just a few rotten apples and it's not the whole barrel to the point we've got a tipping point where even if you are living in a town with good water, how do you know that? How do you know that you're not next? And so if we had just taken some of that money that people are now spending to protect themselves, you know, the bottled water, the home filters and investing in a better water infrastructure or water treatment at the community level, we would all be further ahead. But this is kind of, you know, the lack of, of, you know, common fiscal and financial sense that we have, wherein if we invested a dollar correctly, we'd save $10 tomorrow, one way or another. And so we're not doing that. And it puts these, it, it creates kind of a death spiral, if you will, where um, the, these communities are further uh, financially unstabilized, poor people become poorer, 
And um, if, if it were up to me, I, I would say this is a this is a, a time where we should be, um, you know, pound wise and not penny foolish and, you know, and invest in in this infrastructure that we talk about and talk and talk about and never do anything mm. unless there's a disaster right. like Flint, in which case billions of dollars in relief uh, were necessary when it could have been avoided for a hundred dollars a day. Hmm. What about the public trust? Um, there's been a lot of anecdotally people think trust is shattered in drinking water. Uh, there's been studies that have shown, uh, you know, issues with trust there. Um, how do we, how do we repair that? I, I guess you have to fix the water in situations first, but then how do we get that trust piece repaired? So it's a fascinating question, and you know I'm ashamed to say that that my industry, my profession, has not been worthy of the public trust. You know, this this betrayal could not be more fundamental that we witnessed in Flint. And uh, again, it's not just a case of a one-off. Um, it is you know really an issue. Where and the only thing unusual about Flint is they got caught, and people cared. So this loss of trust, we brought it on ourselves. How do we get out of it? Um, to my mind, the only way to do it is to be completely honest and deserving of the public trust. And that's not very popular <laughs> nowadays, unfortunately, and with good reason, um, because you're, I think people are not going to be happy with you for seeking and speaking the truth. That's why it's so rare. That's why truth seekers and truth speakers are going extinct in today's world. Uh, this this is actually the subject of a new movie by uh, Tony Baxter that's going to air on the BBC in a few months. It's called Flint, Who Do You Trust? And it explores all of these issues, the initial betrayal, uh, the Mark Ruffalo coming to town and creating uh, distrust in the agencies when they really did deserve it, and then the later uh, falling out between myself and a few residents who... Um, didn't want to hear that the water was improving even when it was. Yeah. Um, on, you, you mentioned kind of this work, this investigative science and, and your engineering ethics classes and um, on the solution positive front, I guess. How do you think students that have been involved in these different investigations are becoming prepared to be part of progress? You know, that's one of the things that really gives me hope is, number one, they couldn't screw it possibly up as bad as we did. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I laugh, but yeah, no, I get yeah, it. Yeah, it, it really is true. Um, so, you know, they come in with all these high ideals and, you know, most of our institutions surely but uh, slowly teach you to be unethical. It teaches you to be willfully blind to... Um, to belong to these organizations and look the other way. And so we, we try to talk about how that happens and how you should never be one who gives up on your ideals. You should never be one who forgets the person you once were because someday you could make, you know, wake up and do something you would have once abhorred. So, you know, that's a key part of it. It's an aspirational ethics message. We talk about uh, successes we talk about how to fight for the few people who would go that path. And believe me, there's a lot of reasons not to. Uh, so, you know, the, the first rule is try not to be a screw up yourself. Try not to do something unethical in your career. Cause again, it's not easy. Right. But we also try for a few people who are brave enough to uh, sacrifice themselves and perhaps their professional career career for the greater good you know, how, how you do that. Yeah. Great. Well, Mark, I, I, I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity to catch up and, and talk to you. Uh, obviously I've followed along with everything the past decade or so that's gone on with uh, DC and with Flint. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm glad for the chance to hear directly from you and, and ask some of these questions. So thanks so much for the perspective. Wow. Thank you for having me. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop Podcast is brought to you by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart and stylish way to save water 
energy, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.